Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykant, Superintendent of Schools. The Needham Schools has launched an exciting plan to explore and develop a vision for our students called Portrait of a Needham Graduate. Joining me today to talk about this initiative are several members of the Planning Committee, and I'd like to welcome uh, Cheyenne Raza, a junior at Needham High School. Welcome. Maggie Sharon, sixth grade teacher at High Rock. Tamitha Bibble, principal at Pollard. Mia Cara, one of our parents and uh, Aaron Pressman, who is chair of the school committee. Thank you all for being here to talk a little bit about a Portrait of a Needham Graduate. Aaron, I think actually I'll begin with you and have you maybe share with us what, what is this, uh, what's this plan, what's this initiative all about? You know, Dan, it's almost a cliche to say the world is changing. Maybe we feel like it's changing even more than it ever has before. There's all kinds of ways in which the kids who are in school today need to be prepared for what's coming up. You know, changes like automation, more wireless communication, the way we're all connected all the time, it's changing the job outlook. Um, so we wanted to, as a school committee, make sure that everything we're doing in the schools as much as possible in terms of our goals and our priorities, our curriculum, are preparing students for that future that's coming. And part of the way you need to do that is to examine what are those trends and forces and uh, how does that flow back into what we do every day in the schools. So this is something the school committee and I imagine more broadly the community is very interested in as we you know, move forward for, for our students. I, I know I'm, I'm reminded of as we think about full day kindergarten uh, and those kindergartners who will arrive in our schools in 2019, they'll graduate from high school I believe in 2032. Wow. And when you think about it that way, it, this kind of a discussion and planning is, is really important. Um, Maggie, I, why don't you share a little bit about uh, how, how you got involved in this conversation? I mean, why are you at the table? And by the way, the, the committee has a committee of about 53 folks, parents and community members, business leaders, students, alumni, teachers, uh, and you are all representing uh, those folks. But how did you get involved so sure. in this? Sure. Um, I came to the table as part of the um, leadership of the Needham Education Association, and so sort of sitting as a representative of, of colleagues and teaching staff, we, um, as part of a couple of years ago doing negotiations um, for our contract, conversations arose ab among the teachers about what is, what is sort of the biggest burning issue for, for you. And for our teaching staff at the time, it was really around thinking about the initiatives that we do in Needham and the importance of all the different things that we do, but also for a lot of teachers thinking about how every year there was something new kind of coming down the pike, something interesting, something good, but it wasn't always clear sort of how those different things connected to one another. And, um, you know, over time, there's sort of a pile-on effect of that on the teachers that people started to ask, like, gosh, like, are, are, what is all of this and how is it all connected and is there a big why connected to all of it? And as a result of the work on the contract last year, um, you guys came together with a leadership team and a team of teachers to really look at those questions. And out of that was sort of a, a mutual understanding of, um, you know, that there are lots of things to do, that education is changing all the time, that we need to think about what's best for the kids that we're teaching and the world that they're going to be part of. But also that we need to get really clear about the why we do things so that we are able to look as a system at new ideas and things that we might want to do and figure out whether or not they fit into our collective why as a community. And so having the opportunity to sit at the table with you and with the team for those conversations brought me to wanting to be part of that big conversation about who are the kids that we'll be educating and um, why should we prepare them in certain ways for their future, not you know, our, our past really. I mean, there are so many talented teachers and students mm -hmm. and families in the Needham community who want to do all these really great things. Yeah. But doing a variety of different things, is there a way to pull it together in a mm -hmm. perhaps more structured, more, more yeah. coherent vision right. that really is taking into consideration the economy and, and the environment and, and equity and, and, and long-range planning so that we can really achieve yeah. what it is we, we set out to do? And one of the things that was important to us and I think also important to all of all of us is that that conversation happen with a broad base. So not just 
what the administration wants, not just what the teachers want, but really our whole community. Mm -hmm. what, what's working for students and what do students feel like they need and families and parents? So we're really happy and I'm happy to be part of that um, conversation because I feel like we really have invited a lot of different perspectives to the table to sort of help <laughs> shape and push our thinking so that our vision is truly representative of our community and what we need and what our kids need. Tamitha, why, why uh, from, a, from a building leader's point of view, why is this conversation important and what, you, what draw you to the conversation? So I was excited to um, see the email that you had sent out and the notes that you sent out inviting folks to join this group and, and this work for a number of reasons, Dan. And as a building principal, I think I'm always um, curious about the direction that we need to take our students. I'm always interested in hearing from our students when they've left the Indian public schools and have come back and talked about their successes and maybe some of the areas in which they wished that they had more opportunities. Uh, and it excited me because I knew it was not going to be a conversation that would be in, in, in a vacuum, that we would have students at the table, parents, industry leaders, uh, really far-reaching community members. And I'm always interested in finding ways that we can provide the skills, competencies um, and and even mindset for our students to be able to take on the challenges that we don't even know are going to, to meet them when they leave the need in public schools. And um, as a result, I'm interested to learn about the research that's out there, what other schools are doing, uh, what's happening nationwide but worldwide, and how we can best assure that our students are getting what they need. And I was thrilled to have been asked to join this committee as a building leader because I hope that I can also have some influence on not just Pollard but on what my colleagues are doing in all of the other buildings and be able to represent their voices and to work alongside teachers and students and parents and school committee and other administrators to have that come to fruition. Well you certainly will uh, be influential in the conversation and you, you, your work um, you know, I know share with the other building leaders and principals. There is a lot of interest in folks participating in the portrait of an Eden graduate work. We initially thought that perhaps if we got 35 or 40 people together, we'd be fortunate. Uh, it turned out almost 200 folks in the community <laughs> actually wrote sometimes really long uh, uh, letters uh, imploring to be involved. And we, we settled around 53 folks or so, um, a variety of perspectives, as you suggest. And one of those perspectives, Mia, is the parent perspective sure. and the perspective from the business community. You, you kind of have a dual role here, I think, <laughs> uh, uh, because you bring the voice of higher ed in and, uh, and also as a parent. Why, why did you, uh, when we reached out to the community, sure. why did you say, yes, I'm interested? And in this. I think I was one of those individuals that wrote a long essay <laughs> of, of <laughs> all the <laughs> reasons <laughs> why, please pick me. So my son will enter that kindergarten class that you mentioned, the first full, full day kindergarten class. Um, and I uh, teach in higher education. I'm a psychology professor at Curry College. And I think those two sort of parts of me really wanted me, to, I really wanted to be involved because in higher education, we're seeing sort of this, we're having this similar conversation. What do our students need as they go forward? What are we teaching them? What skills are they coming to us not having? Um, and there seem to be some trends that I've noticed from other colleagues around the country that are also in higher education. Because of, of technology and the influence that we've all started to rely on technology, what are our students no longer, what are some of those basic skills that they don't seem to be as strong in? And then I think about my son and, and the future. We, you know, we want to be strong members. Our family wants to be strong members of this community and, mm -hmm. and to the point that children don't just learn in vacuums, right? That we don't just send them to school and hope that they learn everything there. We have to be a part of the community. I started, I was telling Maggie earlier, I started my career as a first grade teacher. And it was very much a big uh, part of that idea that, you know, schools are part, part of sort of this community effort. We all have to be part of that. And so I wanted to be at the table to help sort of think about how do we continue to help children learn the basic skills, but how do we think of them as sort of being more global and more culturally competent as well? Yeah, and I think w one of the uh, things I've learned initially with some of the parents, our parents uh, who are participating, there are a wide variety of views right, and interests, absolutely. which is really mm -hmm. fascinating. And not surprising, but yeah. it's great to have all these different views and right. voices uh, at the table. Hopefully we're, gonna, we're going to sort <laughs> yeah. it all out. Yeah. 
Another one of the uh, perspectives at the table are our students, and we have four students um, who are part of this conversation. So Cheyenne, why, why invite students? What can you bring to the table? I, I started in the Needham Public Schools in 2006, so our kindergarten is going to be way different than yours, <laughs> son, starting. Um, we had these, these like 30 pound box computers, one or like a couple in each classroom, and and um, you know most of our learning happened on. It's funny to say now, and like pencils and paper, right, chalk, crayon. Mm -hmm. Still, think the same things are going on, but our schools are radically different in terms of technology and um, how we want to go forward in learning. So, one of a fantastic point brought up by one of these speakers at the um, at our conference was that students are learning in more you know virtual reality ways, um, mm -hmm. going out into the world, using technology to like um, hone in our skills in different ways, and. Um, this is totally different from how I was in the kindergarten, not, not all that long ago at all. Um, so obviously how, like the direction that we're gonna be going in won't really apply to me. I'm gonna be graduating in a year, but I think my perspective is valuable as, um, because of the fact that like, I've, I've seen what Needham has, how Needham has developed as, um, as educators, as, as administration, and um, I think I have a good idea of like where we can um, where we can start at, like a starting point for us teachers and students and where kind of we want to see ourselves. Um, yeah. And I, I can okay. imagine your son sitting here uh, 12 years from now uh, saying, you know, things amazing. were so different back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and I think the big box computers. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, things are going to be changing yeah. and perhaps even more rapidly. And yet this conversation that we're having at the first conference that we had, it, it is not all about technology, mm -hmm. although that certainly is a part of the conversation. It, it really can't be the driver of right. the conversation because I think we will miss something. You talk about global responsibility right. and citizenship, right. for example, and that's one of the things I'm hoping we'll have a conversation yeah. about. And I hope children are still using crayons and pencils <laughs> and paper, yeah. right? I mean, I think that right. to not teach children how to use a pencil would be also a big <laughs> mistake, right? Sure. Right. So we had, so our, our committee of 53 uh, folks, we had our first meeting at mm -hmm. uh, a town hall and we had a few guest speakers I'm curious uh, what you individually um, if you want to share if there was something some takeaway some learning from that day that any one of you had either from one of the speakers or an article that we read or a video or one of our panelists who, who shared something um, that the day was crafted as a day of learning and I think mm -hmm. we'll continue that learning although we're going to get into some of the, the work and actually develop uh, documents and, and a portrait uh, anyone um, share or something that you learned in particular that was surprising to you? Oftentimes when people talk about education in the future, you hear things, you know, the importance of STEM. Oh, everyone needs to learn to code. Everyone needs to do this. Everyone needs to do that. And my takeaway from the day, and one of the gentlemen that was in our table group actually, who kind of corrected us on that, he said, oh no, you know, artificial intelligence is gonna be coding in the next five years. If kids are interested in that, that's great, but teaching everyone to do that actually is not the future. And it actually was more of a conversation about the philosophy of what makes us human beings and what, what are the things that make us uniquely human that artificial intelligence and technology isn't gonna replace? And what do we need to do to um, really help grow our are humans into humans who bring something unique. And, what, and, and I did not anticipate it being such a philosophical question that we'd be wrestling with. I think also, you know, in my day job, I'm a business mm -hmm. reporter writing about companies and there's a lot of focus on skills and competencies mm -hmm. and what's needed the next mm -hmm. around the corner. But part of, part of what I started to appreciate from our meeting was that it's almost a mindset that of, mm -hmm. The world is evolving. You need to be able to pick up those new skills and competencies and recognize that you may have limitations and, and where do you need to mm -hmm. add on to your own skills and, and inculcate that in the students that, you know, this is a lifelong thing of learning. It's not going to end when you uh, leave the school house. Sure. You know, I think one of the takeaways for me, um, and not to echo you too, too no. much, but it was really around um, hearing from our students on that day and their sharing of the experiences that they've had that have really Im impacted them. And it was beyond the skills and competencies. Mm -hmm. And it was really around flexible thinking, trying new opportunities, getting out of their comfort zone, giving back to their community, whether it was a service learning project, a gap year, traveling abroad. Um, and so I was really inspired and excited 
hearing from our students and, and hearing their experiences and where they would like to go. And also thinking a lot about the fact that you know, we need to keep providing opportunities for students to get outside of the classroom and to practice these skills and to be able to, to try on um, new hats. And uh, one of the comments was they'll have many more jobs you know, as, they're, as they're maturing than you know, we did. We, we graduated and went into maybe a field and pretty much stayed in that field. Very few people in our generation are, are career changers. But that students coming out today may change a number of different ways. And so the ability to take feedback, to think critically, to be flexible, that those are some of the skills that we really want to teach and encourage in our students as they move forward. Well, personally, I'm hoping that as this process develops that we will we'll agree, uh, it may take some time to get there, that there need to be more, more opportunities, particularly for high school juniors and seniors, to get out into the world and to try things. Even while we are working with them and their parents are supporting them, we can't pretend that it will all happen within the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. I think we would, we would be short-sighted. I don't think we'd be serving uh, those kindergartners in the class Sorry. of 32 uh, well by, by um, just holding on to them. We have to somehow figure out a way for them to engage the, the world. Mia, any learnings or surprises uh, that you picked up yeah, at the we, first? Yeah, we had a student at our table who was part of the MECO program, and she talked a lot about um, sort of how kind of this idea of getting out into the world where she's come across quite a few peers that think that where she's from is like so far away, <laughs> right? And so this idea of getting students out into the world, but even just to their neighbor's house, right? To Boston, to Hyde Park, right? Parts of Boston, and realizing like, that's culture, that's community. It doesn't have to be India. It doesn't have to be China, right? I mean, that's fantastic to see how people are in other countries, but I think personally, part of what we often see as children get older in, in emerging adulthood is this idea of the other being far away as mm. opposed to the other being even here in Needham, right? And so recognizing that there's diversity within our community, having students interact with uh, those that are coming, riding in on a bus from just a neighboring town. Um, and that kind of stuck with me. Um, and also, you know, hearing the students speak uh, really kind of solidified my, my belief that students just need more experiences engaging with adults, having conversations. The, those opportunities, I think, that really, I think, are considered important here in Needham, but just us doing more of it. Aaron said to town meeting the other night that uh, the Needham community, to your point, has, has become more diverse. Absolutely. And it's a, there is an opportunity there mm -hmm. for our, our students and our staff to connect with families in different ways. When I started in Needham 12 years ago, uh, we were about 90% white, and we are now 78% white. So the, the number of students of color, the number of languages spoken, again, when I started in Needham, there were about 30 identified languages of, of families and, and students, and now they're 54. Uh, so that there's this richness right here Absolutely. within our schools mm -hmm. and out in the in the local community Absolutely. that that uh, students can explore. Uh, Cheyenne, I wanted to ask you anything that you shared with a teammate or with your folks uh, about what that day was all about. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest um, takeaways that I had, one of the biggest um, things that I realized is that the public schools, you know, everywhere are in a very difficult position of either either setting kids up for college or setting them up for the workplace. So we got perspectives from both, um, you know, deans and administration officers, uh, yeah, ad yeah, admission officers from, from uh, uh, Olin College, and then we had a few um, industry leaders. And both of them had very different um, view, not very different, but there were different kind of perspectives on what they wanted to see out of public schools. So on one hand, we had college preparation, which is obviously very important, especially in Needham, where many students choose to attend a, a four-year university after high school. There's uh, the SAT scores, getting ready for standardized tests. But then at the same time, uh, the workplace outside of that, it's very much focused on how you use these skills, how you're able to take a set of information and analyze it and use it to your own advantage. So I think that was one of the most eye-opening things for me because I've personally, like I'm, I'm a junior in high school, like I'm getting ready for the college process, but um, keeping in mind that many of the skills that, I, that I'm using now, you know, a lot of them will be useful for me outside of uh, after like I finish my education, but a lot of them 
won't be? And how do we use, how do we start cultivating those skills for um, those who, you know, either may not choose to attend a university or those who uh, do and then need the skills afterwards to go into the workplace? That was a, that was a, um, a, a something that I thought about a lot after our day as well. Um, the idea of schools and public schools being uniquely positioned to serve the whole community, not just um, a particular subset of kids who definitely want to go the four-year college route, but that part of our obligation is to all of our community's children. And um, conversation came up at the table about, um, you know, children with particular special needs and how are we as a community making sure that we're giving all of our kids an opportunity to be the best participant in their life and active participant as you know we are maybe children with particular goals of college or kids who have something else entirely that they want to try and do are we doing things along the way that are supporting all of those children in their goals and you know even the question of kids who might not go directly to our public schools or might go to other schools they're still part of our community and it sort of brought up for me the idea that as public school, yes, we have a particular mission, but we also have to be responsive to all of those community members and be a resource for the community. And how can we do that in ways that are creative, that are um, rigorous for kids to be prepared for whatever outcome they want, but that are also relevant and make kids want to come to school? Because that was something that I heard loud and clear, especially from students. Experiences that they talked about that were really impactful and things that weren't as impactful, and how can we be thinking a lot about doing things with kids in schools that are going to stick with them and feel like they made their time here worthwhile. And to, to me, I just kept thinking, like, we want to educate lifelong learners, mm. right? We don't want you to graduate and be so tired and burnt out that you, you don't even want to go to college, mm -hmm. right? That we want you to say, I want to keep learning. I want to be better. I want to create change. That, that To me, that's so important for us mm -hmm. to think about how do we do that without overwhelming our students as well? Mm -hmm. I forget which one of the speakers said this, but uh, um, I'll have to remember, but one of them talked about the concept of unlearning. Yes, it might have been um, Dr. Miller from Olin. It might have been mm -hmm. Dr. Miller, yes. uh, who was yeah. one of our uh, speakers. Yeah, and it, it's an interesting concept that we, we have to be lifelong mm -hmm. learners, but we also have to give some things up. Um, and uh, that's a, uh, um, it's an important night. Reminds me of a, of a metaphor, a story of um, Gandhi who was catching a train, as sort of the, so the story goes, and as he's running to catch the train, one of his sandals slips off and is left behind on the platform, and he's watching the train pull away from the platform, and he reaches down and takes his other sandal that remains on his foot and throws it off onto the platform, and his colleague said, well, why did you do that? And he said, well, one sandal won't do me any good, but two sandals will do someone else some good mm -hmm. if they, when they come across it. Meaning sometimes you just have to shed something to, to be able to move on and, and also in the process help, help someone. For a moment, I want you to push yourself. So we meet again on June 7th, and one of the things I know that we're going to do, as I understand as this is pulling together, is to identify some something, some skill, some attribute uh, that's important to us personally that we want to put out on the table. Uh, so I'm going to do that right now. I mean, if, if you had to decide, and you're, I'm going to start with you, Aaron. <laughs> if you had to decide what is the thing, what is the skill, what's the attribute, what's the opportunity you would want those members of the class of 2032 to have, what would it be? Look, there's a lot of things I could say, but I think I'm going to go back to my core childhood, which is uh, Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go with empathy. And I think that um, while we talk about preparing kids for college or certain jobs or everything, we also are preparing just people to live in the world, to be citizens of our country in a democracy, to have healthy communities. And so I really want to get you know, that empathy and kindness that we emphasize in our schools now, but I want to make sure those kind of, those kind of skills yeah. are, are on the list too. All right, let's go around. We'll, we won't go, in, uh, we'll, I'll bounce around. Tamitha, for you. So, Aaron, I, I, would, I would agree with that. And I think it's a sense of, um, of responsibility, a sense that, you know, you are leaving knowing that you're a better person and, and you're ready to take on the world or, or be a change agent, but that you're also responsible to bring people along with you and to help in your community and to give that back. And so I think it goes hand in hand with the compassion and, 
and empathy, but, but I would like the responsibility and being civically responsible and environmentally responsible and globally responsible to be part of that as well. Maggie. Aaron, you took mine with empathy. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, building on the empathy and responsibility, I feel I want our kids to leave curious mm. um, in a large sense. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, generally curious about learning, but as they go through their life, curious to understand somebody else's perspective, to figure out more when they don't know how to solve a problem. Okay. Um, All right, Mia? Uh, I'm really torn about this. I, I, I think I'm gonna go with cultural competence mm -hmm. and, and sort of, you know, ties into social emotional learning and all of this, but also just this idea of, being responsible and culturally open um, and sharing perspectives and understanding one's own perspective and, and sort of cultural competence or cultural responsiveness. Um, so I'm gonna have to, yeah. You, ra you round <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to echo um, a lot of you guys here. So um, knowing that you know we may not have all the answers coming out of um, high school, but knowing that we have the skills and the resources and the knowledge available to go about seeking the answers that we want to find. Like a lot of you guys mentioned, um, being able to, to go further and have the responsibility to seek out um, education, seek out the answers when um, we feel the need to. I'm hearing some curiosity in there. And well, I'm hearing empathy and responsible, uh, responsibility for the environment, global responsibility, curiosity, cultural competency, and responsiveness. This is exactly the kind of conversation that we hope to have on June 7th, and actually the work will continue into next year, about a year worth of work, and then we will come to the community and the school committee and say this is the portrait we've created, and hopefully they will affirm it, and then we'll begin the work of, of moving toward that portrait. I appreciate a lot that you're taking the time to participate on this very important uh, committee and this initiative, and I especially appreciate uh, today you sharing your thoughts with the community. Thank you. And Dan, thank th Dan, thank you for getting this all. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs>